Nice buns. Soft, fluffy, and ultra low net carbs. Discover Hero Bread, the delicious ultra low net carb bread with incredible taste and texture. Hero Bread has zero grams of sugar and is under 100 calories per serving. Plus, high in fiber with 5 to 10 grams of protein per serving. Available on Amazon.com, Walmart.com, and at Hero.co. That's H-E-R-O dot C-O. Delicious, ultra-low net carb Hero Bread buns and tortillas. Soft and fluffy, high in fiber, and with zero grams of sugar, up to 10 grams of protein, coming in at under 100 calories. Order today at Hero.co and use the code AH10 to get 10% off your first purchase. That's AH10 at Hero.co, H-E-R-O dot C-O. Order from Hero.co now and get 10% off your first purchase with promo code AH10. That's 10% off with code AH10, H-E-R-O dot C-O. This is Naked Pine. M.I.P. With Masamela Matfumo. Mark Thompson. Naked Pine. Get woke. Ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, no secret the way I speak about my mentor and the impact he had on me. We share the same name but to our knowledge we were not biologically related but he certainly was like a father to me and so many men he helped to raise um including my guest today one of whom was the star point guard for the georgetown championship teams uh there should have been two actually there should have been three but in 84 and 85 he was uh the starting point guard he joins us today michael jackson also i would guess that even through his moments with coach thompson in terms of developing the book i'm sure coach thompson had a profound and paternal influence on him as well the co-author of the autobiography of coach thompson jesse washington dropping this week i came as a shadow john thompson an autobiography. We want to welcome Brother Michael Jackson and Brother Jesse Washington. Welcome, brothers. How are you today? I'm wonderful. Thank you. Good. Glad to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you both for being here. Jesse, I, I want to want to start with you. As I said, um, Jesse is, folks, ladies and gentlemen, the Alex Haley of this autobiography. I think that's the best way to put it. And when Coach Thompson and I talked about how he wanted to do this, that's the model uh, that that we came up with. Jesse, tell us a little bit about your experience and your first meeting uh, with Coach Thompson as you all got together to talk about the autobiography. Well, for anybody who's ne- ever met Coach Thompson, he has a piercing gaze. And I certainly felt it the day that I met him. Uh, I was invited to his house to meet with him, his son, John, and his daughter, Tiffany, as they were considering writers for the book. And he asked me a lot of tough questions. Uh, One of them was, I showed up dressed like I usually am, which is some semi-casual pants and a polo shirt with a collar. And he said, why did you dress like that to come here today? (laughs) He didn't say that he liked it or didn't like it, but he just threw that question out at me. Uh, His son, John, asked why I was wearing Adidas when Georgetown was a Nike program. Um, he also said, yeah, Jesse, well, you know, you've never written a book before. So what makes you think you could do this one? Um, but I made my case and I'm thankful that he uh, chose me. Um, I felt that it was a privilege and a responsibility to bring his story to the world for eternity because it's so important, so unique. No one else like him in the history of sports or in American history. And the experience working with him was, uh, a, a dose of what you all got being a part of his program. I was never good enough basketball player to play for Georgetown, but there were moments where I felt like I had the name on my chest. Uh, He had a way of inspiring you, of making you want to do your best. And then when he doled out that approval, yeah, this is good, Jesse, you're doing a good job. You know, I felt like I was ready to go out and play some defense. (laughs) 
<laughs> um, Michael Jackson. Um, um, I um, was fortunate enough to have been asked to share some of uh, my remarks at at the services. Uh, brother, we want to hear from you. The audience wants to hear from you about uh, the impact Coach had on your life. And Patrick and I have talked a lot about, and others of us have talked about a lot about how we have been dealing since his passing. Even JT3 and Ron and I have talked about that. But let's hear from Michael Jackson. What, what, how has this been for you in terms of, of dealing with uh, Coach's transition? It's been, to be honest with you, it's, uh, he's a man that I used to confide in. I used to talk to quite a bit, um, a lot more than some people may think. Um, he was very easy for me personally. I can't speak for anybody else to get a hold of and to be in contact with, as I'm sure you know, because you were one of the people who were working with him. So it, whether it was for work or whether it was for personal development, no matter what it was for, or just call and just talk about nothing or the game or just life in general was something that was constant in my life. And when that's taken away, um, <clears throat> You sometimes reflect on the impact that it has, and it was, it has had, and it's it's a huge impact that has is a void in my life right now. Yeah, yeah, I think that speaks for us all, Jesse. How? Give us an idea, because because this was was, I remember the conversations about you coming on board. You must have spent countless hours with Coach. Give us give the audience an idea of just how much time you spent with him and how that process went. Yes. Uh, can't really count the amount of time for which I'm grateful. He was ready to work and he was about his business. So, uh, but he was very respectful of my time and, uh, and, but it was, it was clear to me that this was his, a top priority for him. And so typically we would meet for two or three days a week. Uh, we would meet and, and you know, at the at the end of the week or he would just call me up on a Sunday and say, OK, what's the plan for this week, Jesse? <laughs> and so that was his way of saying, um, I'm ready to get down. You know, you need to come down here. What you got? You know, when, you, when are you going to be here? <laughs> but he wouldn't say come here at X, Y, Z time. We developed a routine about the time of day and the relative length of the schedules uh, of the sessions. Rather, we would meet at Georgetown and he had a room kind of cleared out where he set up all of these scrapbooks that had chronicled every stage of his career from St. Anthony's forward. These scrapbooks were compiled by Mary Fenlon, and she had kept them with great detail over the years. Uh, more than 20 scrapbooks, this thick each, full of all of the, the instances um, and the, the stories, the highs, the lows, the wins, the losses. And he expected me to come up with a topic for the day. He wouldn't just sit down and say, boom, boom, boom. Um, he would say, what you got? What are we doing today? However, occasionally he would come with something that he wanted to get off his chest, a point that he wanted to make. It was never related to a particular game. It was never related to anything that we had read about in the newspaper during his career. It was always a philosophical point, something that he wanted black folks and all folks to know, to think about, to reflect. Um, you know, he says throughout the book, I really considered myself a teacher. So sometimes he will come with a lesson that he would want to explain. And as we developed a rhythm and a flow, he would understand that he could just kick out all these ideas. I would record, you know, sort of put them together and we would go from there. Mm -hmm. Sounds Jack like a practice. <laughs> right. <laughs> if they were, we'd be in there for about three hours. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> that was definitely a practice. No, that, that, was, that was definitely a practice. Michael, speaking of which, how did you first meet Coach Michael Jackson, and, and how did you end up choosing to go to Georgetown? Uh, that's a good question. I, <clears throat> I was recruited by Georgetown, um, and I saw him at, at, at one of my high school games. And, you know, when you're on the court, you're playing or you're warming up and, you know, coach seems to stand out, if you know what I mean, when he walks in the gym and people tend to notice when somebody's 6'10", 280, 280 pounds, um, they stand out when everyone else is around six feet or under. 
And um, he just sat and watched uh, very politely, didn't say anything, and then he left. Um, the assistant coaches are the ones who did the majority of the work. Uh, but there is a funny story of when um, he came on the recruiting trip to my home. And, um, you know, I had a bunch of questions for him, and I thought I was, at the time, I thought I was doing okay because I was uh, fairly highly recruited. And so I had these questions written out for him that I wanted to ask him, you know, what, what guarantees do I have of you staying at Georgetown was one of the questions. Um, how much playing time am I going to get? And those of you who know him know that those are not questions that you should be asking. Um, but my naivete uh, and thinking that I had everything going in my direction, the tables quickly turned. And he was – he was eloquent in the way that he put it, but he was very stern in saying, you have no guarantees. You're not going to be guaranteed to play. The only thing that I will ever guarantee you and guarantee your mother, who was sitting at the table as well, is that you will graduate. And he knew what to say when parents were there. Because when he left, my mother said, oh, that's the school you're going to. That is the school. Because you, you're going to get an education. Whether or not you can play or bounce the ball or not is another story. But you're going to get an education. So um, it was it was really insightful, um, and he made me understand the value of self, because one of the things that he said was, <clears throat> "Hey, I owe it to myself. I put myself in the position to warrant other schools wanting my talent. So I need to listen to them, and then I'll make an informed decision." So that was the guarantee I had that he would stay at Georgetown. I didn't have that guarantee. Right, right, right. And it's 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 uh, it's formed a lot of the way that I think, and also during my time I'm retired now, the way I managed um, in corporate America as well. Yeah, but it's it's interesting and ironic for you to say that because as I was reading the book, and if, if I have this right, Jesse, Coach describes in the book um, how he made you a selfless player on the court. And how if you had been in another place, you might have even been a higher scorer and all of that. So while he was teaching the importance of self on the court, he he had you in a selfless role, didn't he? Yeah, somewhat. You know, in the book, uh, I mean, it was it was very flattering, very flattering to hear hear those words. And, and he has said that in my presence before um, around me being able to score. And I knew I could Michael's a very mild person. Uh, he could have averaged 20 plus anywhere he wanted to, yeah. but he gave up those points and those individual accolades to win a championship. Please continue, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, I, I knew what the team needed at the time. And, um, you know, we had discussions, uh, not, not many. Uh, but we had discussions of what he wanted me to do. But there were times in the course of a game where he would tell me to, to just go for mine. How many coaches actually do that? Uh, not many. But, um, you know, he I, and I also got cursed out quite a bit. Uh, he claims and he said it, and it's in the book that he cursed me out more than any other player. I don't know what that was other than my freshman year, I found out that I had there was something wrong with my left ear. So half of the things he was saying, I couldn't hear him anyway. So, <laughs> so he wasn't getting a response from me. So I, I stayed even keel and my, I didn't have much of a facial expression. That's because I couldn't hear half the things he was saying. And <laughs> at the time, I didn't know he was talking to me. <laughs> so <laughs> he felt comfortable, um, you know, yelling and cursing at me. But at, at, after a while, I understood what he was doing. There's some time, and he explained it. He didn't explain this while I was there. He explained this after I left, graduated Georgetown. He said, you know, Michael, there's there's times when you have to talk through one person to affect somebody else. I knew you could handle me cursing at you, but I was talking to, you know, player B or player C or player D um, to get us to to the position where we needed to be in order to try and win. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. 
And um, he got that from Red Arbat. Right. You know, he, and he describes that in the book, too, where Red would, if the team wasn't rebounding, he'd curse out Tommy Heinsohn and then mumble, you too, Russell. So, <laughs> so uh, that's, you know, he learned these things from the greats. Yeah, no, no question about it. Jesse, you and I have been talking, you know, leading up to the publication and, and all of that about the, the cultural influence of of Georgetown. Um, share with us. Um, well, first of all, your own, Jesse, your own reflections on the cultural influence Georgetown had um, and then how coach felt about that influence. Man. Well, I'm a couple years younger than Michael. So when they were winning these championships, I was uh, early in high school, you know, a young teenager. And uh, so number one, to see a black authority figure and to see a team that was so disciplined, well organized, but yet and still aggressive, tough, hood, if you will. But with that refined edge, um, I had never seen anything like it. And in my unformed mind, it had a very deep and aspirational impact. Um, all the other times when you see athletic excellence for me as a, as a young man and a sports fan, there was always a white guy in charge. And so I wasn't consciously thinking about these things, but I absorbed it. And to have Georgetown be the best team and was uh, and to be conducting themselves in that type of fashion um, and to be that good and to be that strategic and to play that coordinated together had a profound impact on me and to see a black man in charge. And so then outside of that, this was, you know, I'm a child of the original hip hop era. So hip hop was just. It wasn't what it was today where everybody loved it. Everybody <laughs> hated it. Everybody hated hip hop. It's not music. It's thugs. It's this, it's that. And Georgetown was the number one banner of hip hop in attitude, in style. Um, Nikes was just getting hot at the time. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't like it is today. There was no such thing as a sneaker head. You know, people didn't wear sneakers with their suits and things like that. And them, those Nikes that, that the Hoyas had, the gray ones with the blue, the dunks with the Hoyas on the heel, man, like those were, those were it. And we love those. And, and it was part of the whole mystique and the, the style and the attitude all came together. And it was like Georgetown was hip hop. It was the basketball form of hip hop. And given the, the way that, you know, music and sports has always resonated in the hood. It was just the alchemy, man. And it, it just made something incredibly special. And all the ingredients, if you know, you had the, the attitude, the look, the style, the blackness, um, the funk. It was just a very, very powerful force. And it was a different era. We didn't have we weren't flooded with all these images like we were now, like we are now. Everything wasn't just a phone tap away. You could turn on the TV once in a while or get a magazine once a week and, and get that dose of Georgetown. When you got that dose, it was it was to the head. And so that was how I really experienced it. And then, you know, when I worked on the book with Coach, it was very hard to get him to speak at length about the impact that he had. Mm -hmm. he did not want to dwell on his accomplishments and things like that. Um, there's a quote in the beginning of the book that he liked to say frequently. Um, Call your employment by its lowest name. So he was never, oh, I did this or, oh, I did that. Um, but when you would twist his arm, he'd be like, yeah, I saw, you know, all the black kids out there wearing our jackets and, and hats and stuff like that. And, you know, I appreciated that um, because it said to me that we stood for something more than basketball. You know, and, and so that's what it symbolized him. He well, deep, all you got to do is. Just... Go ahead, Michael. No, but all you got to do is just look. All you got to do is look at the movies of the mid to late 80s and early 90s. You know, everything from Do the Right Thing, which had a lot of Jordan stuff, but um, Boys in the Hood, et cetera, with, with the Georgetown T-shirts, Georgetown sweatshirts, the hats. It was, it, was, it was amazing. And we knew that we were the number one licensed product in the U.S. at the time. Um, didn't know what that truly represented, 
but we, we knew how popular it was. And the big thing, and it's what hip hop has actually done as well, is it crossed over. And you saw, you know, all the kids in the neighborhood wearing it, but you also saw kids outside of the neighborhood wearing it. And you saw white kids wearing it as well. Um, and what it represents. I don't know how many people thought that Georgetown was an all black school at one point because of the type of players that were on the court, you know, for, for so long, for so many, for so many years, back to back to back to back. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Michael, when, in that moment, and you were there at the height of that cultural phenomenon. Um, were you, and you said you didn't, you all don't really know it. So you all weren't really aware on the floor just what, how big the influence was, or, or were you? No, not, 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 not really. No, no. And you know, you know this from your time at Georgetown. Um, coach had chairs set up on the side of the, of, of, of the court. And there were days or times when he would just, it would be a teaching lesson to where he would ask us, and this is in the book as well, where he would ask us questions. Um, and he always challenged us to challenge authority. Um, and to question, not to challenge authority, but mainly to question authority, question why you do what you do. And we had one of the players, and he's named in the book, but I won't name him here, who, you know, you always had people because we were, on, we were the most televised team in the U.S. in the 80s, the most televised collegiate team. And so we were, old, we were very marketable. Now, did we totally understand what being marketable was at that time? No. Um, but, you know, obviously other people did. So you would often, as you were walking down Entry Street or Wisconsin, you would often get people offering you things for free, whether it's sneakers, whether it was jeans. And so one of the players came in wearing something other than Nike. And Coach said, why are you doing that? You know, he had us, he, he set us up, and then, you know, you stood right in front of the chair, and then he would talk for about 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Then he would say, sit. Then you could sit. Uh, but you could just go over there and just, just sit. Right. And then he asked the player, why are you wearing this? And he told him who, who was wearing the shoe. He told him how he got it. He's like, well, you know, I get paid for you all to wear Nike. And we look at him, we like, we knew he got something because we would see, you know, when Nike would send the product in and we would see them bringing it into the McDonough arena. Um, but we didn't get much of it. As you know, <laughs> we, we got what we needed to, to play. And that was about it. Um, but then he asked, well, why haven't you asked me for any of that money? And we're sitting there and we're looking at one another and we're like, is he really asking us this question? And it made you think. He's like, I want you guys to think about this. And then tomorrow we're going to have a discussion about it. And the next day we, we did our normal warm up before practice and we spent the rest of the practice, the next two hours talking about that. And he had Miss Finland go up and get his contract and show us how much he was making and what was in the contract. To educate us to inform us and to challenge us to challenge and question authority. But he, yeah. he, he, he then, if any of you ever come in and ask me that you're not, or tell me that you're not going to the product, that was the last time you played here at Georgia. So we knew what the answer was, but um, it was, it, it's, it was a huge learning experience for, for myself and the, uh, my, my teammate. Yeah, that, that, that was him. Um, ever the teacher. Um, Jesse, Michael mentioned being the most televised team and being marketable. But that was interesting, too, because while Georgetown was very popular and on TV, I mean, the way Coach carried himself, the swagger the team had, the uniforms, all of that was still kind of intimidating to a lot of white folks. This big black team rolling up in town. Some folk weren't in love with that, yet they as as Michael said, it was marketable. Can can you recognize? I mean, uh, reconcile the controversy and the marketability, Jesse? Hmm. Yeah, the uh, the mainstream media narrative made Georgetown into the villain, into the bad guy, into the big black boogeyman. You know, and so it cultivated sometimes deliberately, sometimes unconsciously, but always it still happened 
a, a, a negative image of Georgetown as dangerous, thugs, uh, out of control, you know, bad guys. Some of the headlines as I was going through those scrapbooks in the office, some of the headlines will call coach himself, uh, ogre, um, Darth Vader, the Hoya Tola, you know, um, you know, monster, all these things. I mean, like, and coach in the book, he's like, well, we weren't hitting people over the head and robbing them. We were playing basketball, you know? Um, and so, uh, there were a lot of people who really hated Georgetown and developed this racist misconception of the team. And coach Thompson was very aware of that in the moment he didn't deal with it, but he deals with it extensively in the book, in the book, including the perception of him as intimidating um, and how that comes out of racial stereotypes. I really want to let him say his piece on that. So I hope that all of you pick up the book and read it for himself. But it was really interesting. Um, over the years, his uh, some of that pejorative characterization of coach was toned down. They realized what a teacher and humanitarian and good person he was. But just yesterday, a prominent journalist, not a racist, not a conservative, just your average progressive white journalist out here um, was interacting with some of the promotional material for the book on Twitter. And he said, you know, I never liked Coach Thompson, but I think that, I, you know, I'm going to read this book and so on and so forth. Mm. Why would, you know, did anyone ever say that about Coach K, you know, or um, Coach Dean Smith or, you know, these type of people? Um, just a black man being as proud and unapologetic as he was refusing to yield to the stereotypes or the concepts of what he of what others felt that he should do rubbed a lot of America the wrong way and turned him and his team into the villain. Yeah. And and that's why we all loved it. Loved every minute of it. Uh, and it was even let me say this before I forget. There was even something about Michael's name. Georgetown had swagger, but then they had a, a, a starting point guard named Michael Jackson. Even that gave uh, some some cachet to the whole thing. All of that was just cool. Here come Michael Jackson, you know. And I mean, he had a he had a popular name. Michael, um, uh, uh, during the the whole villainization process, and and you were there again when that hit its height. Did that affect you and any of the guys in that era on the court? I know Patrick was was often singled out. But what about you and others? Uh, the villainization, um, some of the attacks, some of the things that were were said. Hoya paranoia ended up having a, a a double entendre. It was like, you know, coach being concerned about the press, but then it got it flipped into something else. Y'all just rolling up in gyms, intimidating everybody. But when that villainization process was going on, how were you cognizant of that going on around you, and how did it impact you? Very cognizant of it. Going on, all of us as players, we would sometimes have players only meetings or team meetings and we would talk about it. And coach always taught us that the way you can affect that is by winning. Just flat out just win. And, um, we ended up, it, 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 it brought us together as a unit, as a team, because we had, we had one goal and it was similar to when you guys mentioned about my ability to score. Our goal was to win. By any means necessary, but our goal was to win. And a lot of times we would go into a opposing team's gym and just love that experience. We loved, we wanted them to boo us. We wanted them to throw oranges like they did in Syracuse at the Dome. When we went to Pitt, when we went to the Palestra my freshman year and played, and we had bottles and cans thrown at us as we went out to warm up and as we go back into the locker room. Um, you know, you, 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 you thrived in that. Well, we did. We thrived in that environment. We liked, um, to go in and then you walk away with a win. Um, we would, we, you know, during my four years there, we preferred in all honesty to play away from home than to play, um, at the cap center. We enjoyed that more because we enjoyed going in and silencing the crowd. Yeah. 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 No, that's that's real. Um, Jesse Coach also addresses because this is very recent. I mean, they they finished this book this year, folks. Um, so Coach talks about George Floyd, 
and the reckoning that has happened with America. So, Jesse, the audience, the, the readers, those of you who get the book, and we strongly encourage you to do that, you get a glimpse of, of Coach's thoughts on race, even in the current moment um, with George Floyd. And as I've said before, that was our last conversation um, about George Floyd and the protests and all of that. But but we get a sense of of how he felt about issues like that in the book, don't we, Jesse? Yes. And he was gratified by what these young people were doing. Coach loved to see young people expressing themselves, uh, questioning authority, challenging people. And Coach cared uh, so deeply about Black empowerment, about equality. And he recognized that how far we still have to go. So he was very gratified and encouraged and pleased to see people protesting to see Kaepernick taking a knee, to see all of these athletes coming into their own uh, in terms of using their voices to seek social justice, which he was really the pioneer of. I mean, think about what a big deal we made out of it when the NBA, when Jacob Blake was killed and the NBA refused to play two games. Coach Thompson uh, refused to coach two games when the NCAA tried to pass a discriminatory academic rule that would have disproportionately affected black players. He walked out, got huge media coverage and forced the NCAA to rescind the rule. And so the idea of boycotting a game, whether we know it or not, Coach Thompson helped plant that seed. So to see all this stuff going on, he was he was extremely encouraged. (coughs) Michael, what impact before it's time? No, go ahead, Michael. Go ahead. I'm sorry about that. No, go ahead. You're fine. Go ahead, brother. Uh, you're I was good. just saying he's a man before his time. I mean, you, he's a man before his time. A lot of the things that he stood for and did um, are coming to fruition today. Um, if you think of Me Too and the women's movement, you think of the only, the only trainer I've ever known and the best trainer I've ever known was Lori Mike, a female, a white female who went everywhere with us. The person second in charge of Georgetown, again, another white female, was Mary Fenner. And he put them in the forefront. He was the first person to put a woman on the bench. She sat on the bench even before I got there. Now you see that everybody celebrating, as they should. Coach never gets the credit. He never got the credit he deserved for being a pioneer in so many different and important issues in society today. He was the first to do a lot of things that people, you know, and we mentioned this early on in the podcast, that people frowned upon. You know, Kerry Patrick, uh, Sports Illustrated, the way he wrote about us, and we knew this. It was racist. Uncalled for. Yeah. 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 No question about it. Um, On the women's piece, of course, (laughs) I must acknowledge a member of my extended family who's mentioned frequently in the book, Dr. Nita Hughes. And when I got to Georgetown, Coach didn't know my relationship to Dr. Hughes and I didn't know his at the time. And we learned that later. And and one of the when he finally put all that together, put two and two together, he would really honor me because he would be places we might be on the same radio show. We'd be both in the same day as sitting where we were. And he would say, Mark Thompson and I uh, have something in common and that we were both mentored by the same black woman, the same strong black woman, Dr. Nita Hughes. And I thought it was really a high honor uh, for him to say that because we we had that in common. But clearly we were not uh, peers. Um, But Lori Michael, Mary Finland, the other things he did, even the mentoring he did um, for women coaches and women players. Um, he acknowledges Dr. Hughes having um, a, a significant role uh, in that. And that's that's very, very important. Uh, brothers, to close out, um, um, Jesse, did this experience. And let me just say this, too. Speaking of selflessness, I want people to get this. Um, I was also fortunate enough to have been asked by coach <laughs> to help him identify and as told to author, which is very different than someone doing an unauthorized biography. Any one of us can write a biography on anybody. 
But to do to have the relationship Malcolm X and Alex Haley had um, take someone exceptional and take someone as selfless as an author as Michael was on the court. There was one um, I won't mention his name, but there was one author, very prominent author who was the consummate sports historian. And he had already written not a book on Georgetown, but written about black coaches and black athletes in another book. And coach was so impressed and he had all of this deep, in-depth history of Georgetown and he was strong in his articulation. And so we went down this road and I introduced them. But um, he didn't want to do an as told to. He wanted to be the author of the book. And so when coach found you, Jesse, and recommended you, um, he was very, very pleased with your selflessness because this is how he wanted it to be done. And, you know, as uh, the good Lord would have it, coach transitioned and now you are the spokesperson for the book. But I want to commend you for your selflessness. That's exactly what he was looking for. You've been through a few people, like I said, the person before you. I mean, this was a scholar and he probably would have had a million footnotes. And we were like, well, if you want to write a book about Georgetown, write a book about Georgetown. But this book has to come in coach's voice. Um, and so um, I want to commend you for that in, in serving him that way. In closing, first, you, Jesse, uh, what impact did this process have on you uh, meeting him, getting to know him, hearing these stories um, and picking up this baton right now to tell his story, what impact did he have on you in this process? Very significant impact, I think, in a lot of ways that I'm still have yet to fully understand. Um, I think the biggest impact that I feel at the moment with the release of the book next week is uh, a feeling of responsibility. He conveyed this feeling of responsibility through how he felt compelled to help others, to make sure that he knew that his success or failure, his actions would affect the opportunities that a lot of other black coaches and black people outside of sports receive. And so I felt the responsibility not only to effectively convey his lessons, but to to make sure that people to make it memorable, to make sure that this book goes down for all time as a pioneer in black freedom, really. And so he conveyed to me a responsibility to help others, that you're not just in it for yourself. You're not just in it for your own glory or your own money. But collectively, as a community and as a nation, we have a responsibility to solve this problem that has been put upon us. Um, so that's probably the biggest way. And also, I, I felt that it was a privilege to get to soak up his wisdom for two years. You, you all know, knew him for a lot longer than I did and definitely can can appreciate the gems that he would drop on us. I got a lot of them in a concentrated period of time, and I'm thankful for it. Amen. Michael, coach's lasting impact on you. What is any specific or, or singular message that you carry forward in your life from him? and and what do you hope people get uh, from his own words in this book? I came as a shadow. I got to tell you, I, I was, I am dumbfounded of how well written and well thought out this book is. Um, the, do- the job that Jesse did is phenomenal, in my humble opinion. Um, I knew a lot of what is in the book on the periphery, but getting the details as it's so well, elo- you know, eloquently put. Um, it just, it takes me back, but it also is inspiring to learn um, of how one individual can affect how we live our lives today and inspire us to even be better. Um, so Jesse, my, my hat's off to you for the job that you've done and how you were able to put pen to paper and convey the message that Coach, I know Coach wanted and if he was alive today, would be very proud of um, right now. But, um, you know, it's it's hard for me to put into words um, what Coach meant and what he means to me. Um, you know, my, my favorite chapter in the book um, 
is do not forget. And I, I'll carry that with me. I'll carry everything that's in the book with me, but especially that portion of the book and what it meant. And I think that was just an example of what we went through and you as well, Mark, what we went through um, as someone who was able to be associated with coach for four years um, while we were at Georgetown. You and I are both lucky that we continued the relationship after we graduated and um, got to know him not only as a coach, but as, as a person, as a human being as well. And um, one of the funny things that would happen when we were in practice, he would say, look to your left and look to your right. Now, would you hire that rascal if you owned your own company? <laughs> and then he made sure that we understood the value of. <laughs> he made sure sure that we understood the value of being a good person, doing your work, and also the people up on the hill, as we would call it, up in class. That you need to befriend some of those rascals because they're gonna have jobs for you and your kids later on in life. I mean, the wisdom that he 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 laid on us was it's just. It's unbelievable. And I remember calling him about four or five years after graduating, just thanking him for the things he said. And he was, as usual, he was he was very humble about it. I said, yeah, you were one of the few who listened, son. You were just one of the few who listened. And I'm, I'm, I, and I'm glad you did. But uh, keep, doing the thing, keep doing the things that you're doing in corporate America. So um, there's so many things I can say right now. I can go on literally for hours to talk about coach and, and the impact that he's had on my life personally, but also the impact that he's had on society in general. Because like Jesse just pointed out, what the NBA just did, he did back in 88. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Folks, the book, John Thompson, an autobiography, I came as a shadow. Uh, please read it. Um, Folks, we're supposed to not we're not supposed to be traveling all in each other's faces during this COVID. So I hope that what you all can do, you can order this book. It's available right now um, and shared with loved ones. Um, and it's it's a wonderful piece, a wonderful read, a, a wonderful story and really reflects um, the history of our people uh, spanning almost the past 80 years. They, I promise you. There are stories and anecdotes in this book that you will be able to relate to with regards to your parents or your grandparents and where we came from as a people, the, the struggle from, from poverty uh, to acceptance to ed through education to going to Georgetown. Um, it, is, it is a truly African-American story and the great migration of coaches' life throughout and the impact it had upon all of us, <clears throat> I confess, you know, it's still hard um, to talk about coach without being emotional because he literally saved many of our lives. We know the story about Rafael, uh, but there were other Rafael-like situations. Um, that many of us had to overcome. Some of our rafles were some of our own relatives and coach was there to help some of us through that um, and stepped in as a father when some of our fathers couldn't, um, when they were too damaged and too wounded from racism themselves. So this is an incredible story. Jesse's promised me it's going to be made into a movie, and it should be. Uh, <laughs> so we support that as well. But I want to thank my brothers <laughs> and thank them for what they've done. I, uh, Michael Jackson, my brother, who, again, we all looked up to and admired. I was in high school. Jesse, I think you and I are about the same age. I was a freshman in the, in the fall of 85. Uh, and so the latter part of high school, we saw Michael. And saw everything he, he was doing in terms of leading that team. So Michael is very important to this story and very important to the Georgetown legacy. We're thankful to you, Michael Jackson, for joining us on Make It Plain. Jesse Washington, thank you for taking 
coach's words and and putting it all together in this way so that uh, he would have such a lasting legacy. We thank you too, Jesse Washington. Thank you both, brothers. Thank you. All right, Thanks. folks. Thank came you. in the shadow. Pick it up. Share it with everyone. I've been ordering copies, sending them all over the place. So you all do the same. Thank you. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. Please remember to listen, like, subscribe. And wherever you get your podcasts, please give the show a five-star rating. And please do spread the word. Let's all continue to pray for each other during this pandemic and this police-demic. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been made plain. barbecue hero with delicious ultra low net carb hero bread buns and tortillas soft and fluffy high in fiber and with zero grams of sugar up to 10 grams of protein coming in at under 100 calories per serving oh and did i mention they taste like their mouth-watering traditional versions i mean what's not to love use code ah10 for 10 percent off your first hero bread purchase at hero.co that's ah10 for 10 percent off at hero.co